Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm here today with Dr. Aran Ilinov. He is an MD, PhD, and a professor of immunology. He is the principal investigator of two labs, one at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Tel Aviv, Israel, and the other at the German Cancer Research Center in Heidelberg, Germany. His research focuses on understanding the complex interaction we have with the bacteria in our gut and how this shapes human health and disease. Dr. Ilinov, along with his collaborators, discovered that people consuming identical foods have diverse metabolic responses that depend on a variety of factors, including microbiome composition. He also discovered, along with his collaborators, that bacteria in our gut are on a circadian rhythm and how this may have metabolic consequences that depend on when we eat in addition to what we eat. So I'm, I'm very excited. We're going to talk about a lot of interesting stuff, all things microbiome today. I kind of want to start off, Iran, with the circadian rhythm that the gut microbiome is on and how this can relate to meal timing and metabolic responses. We have talked quite a bit about circadian rhythms on the podcast from you know, the master circadian clock in our suprachiasmatic nucleus and how light resets that clock and um, how there's peripheral circadian clocks in other organs, such as the liver, and how food intake is the major signal that resets that clock. So a few years back, your lab discovered that the bacteria that reside in our gut have their own circadian rhythms. So can you talk, maybe just explain a little bit about this to people? Absolutely. It's great to, to be talking to you, Rhonda. Um, we, we have uh, done a lot of research um, in trying to understand better how the composition of diet impacts our gut microbes and through uh, inter interactions uh, with our mic microbes uh, uh, mediate uh, metabolic health and metabolic disease. But surprisingly, we stumbled upon a, a quite major discovery um, in which not only the composition of diet impacts our gut microbes, but actually the, the timing of diet has an independent and very peculiar um, effect uh, on the composition and on the function of our gut microbes. And through these time-dependent interactions, our gut microbiome can independently uh, impact our metabolic health or our propensity to develop diseases such as obesity and uh, type 2 diabetes. And, and basically, the discovery came across a, a very laborious uh, project in which we tried to characterize the composition and the function of our gut microbes at different time points along a 24-hour cycle. Um, so basically, my students sampled uh, mice or humans each uh, uh, um, uh, for uh, every four hours uh, of an entire 24-hour cycle. And then uh, we were surprised to find that many of the functions um, of our microbes change in very consistent manners along the course of a day. Now, now, this was super surprising to us because if you think about it, our gut microbes live completely in the dark. So how do they know that it's day or night and change their activity so reproducibly at the exact same hours along um, uh, a 24-hour cycle? And this, this led to three years of intense research. And the answer was that our microbes sense the timing in which we eat or do not eat and change their activity accordingly. In other words, during the day when humans are awake and eating, the microbes behave in one way, but during the night when we're asleep, they behave in very different manners. And in mice, which um, um, are awake at night and sleep uh, uh, during the day, this activity is completely opposite. So I have a, a follow-up question for you. Um, we, you know, there's been a lot of research that have looked at how many genes in our body and, and particularly genes that relate to metabolism are controlled, you know, via circadian rhythm. And so, for example, you know, there've been quite a few studies now that have shown that people are, if you give them identical foods in, in the morning versus the evening time, and you look at postprandial glucose response, for example, you'll see that people you know, the postprandial glucose response is much higher in the evening. People are more insulin sensitive in the morning um, as well. So do the bacteria in our gut, is there a role that they play in energy production in perhaps the <clears throat> postprandial post glucose response, for example? That, that, that was one of the most surprising and intriguing part of, of our discovery. Um, not only did we discover that um, the timing of our diet impacts 
the composition and the function of our gut microbes throughout the course of a day, we found that this amazing tangle between our diet and our microbes also signals to the host, to mice in some cases and to humans in other studies which we conducted. And basically the circadian microbial activity builds into the circadian clock, which hallmarks every cell and organ in our body. In other words, the microbial circadian rhythmicity is a, is a critical part that participates in disorderly diurnal behavior of our cells and uh, our organs at uh, different locations in our body. And once we disrupt the uh, circadian microbial uh, activity, for example, by changing the patterns of our diet or by subjecting mice to jet lag behavior, the microbes go crazy and stop behaving in disorderly uh, um, manner throughout the course of a day. And this directly reflects on how the host uh, uh, behaves in its normal circadian uh, behavior. And we found that once we disrupt the microbes, the host is now susceptible to develop obesity and type 2 diabetes, which is exactly the set of diseases which hallmark humans, which uh, feature a chronic disturbance in their wake sleep uh, patterns, such as shift workers uh, um, that are at a substantial risk of developing obesity and type 2 diabetes. And for many years, we didn't know what was the missing link that caused this uh, risk behavior. And now we think that at least part of the answer lies within the microbes themselves. Do you, do you think that there's any s potential solutions for, for example, shift workers who are awake in the evening hours and eating food? Um, so we've learned a lot about time-restricted eating or time-restricted feeding and how that can potentially positively impact, you know, a, a shift worker's metabolism if they try to limit their food, for example, into a, a certain time window, maybe 10 hours, you know. Uh, rather than, you know, eating throughout the time that they're awake at night. Um, do you think that this also has implications for affecting the gut microbiome as well, doing this time-restricted eating if you're a shift worker or even in general? Uh, absolutely. And and what we've discovered, um, at least in mice, and also to some extent uh, we and others have discovered this to uh, occur in humans, is that the dominant factor that determines the uh, diurnal activity of microbes throughout the course of a day is the timing of our feeding. And when we disrupt the timing of our feeding, for example, by subjecting mice to a shift work kind of lifestyle or jet lag, or even in genetically clock deficient mice, um, um, we disrupt the, the microbial circadian activity. However, if we take all of these disrupted conditions and now we um, time restrict the feeding of these mice to imitate the normal uh, um, eating behavior in non-disrupted mice, then we can completely restore the microbiome circadian activity and its effect on the metabolic and immune function of the host. Um, so, so at least um, in mice and to some extent in humans, indeed, time-restricted feeding could uh, restore an altered microbial behaviors across uh, a behavior across the, the course of a 24-hour cycle. However, you know, if you think about it. This does not really solve the human problem because if, if a doctor or a physician uh, or a nurse uh, in a hospital has to go through a, a night shift and therefore features a, a disrupted microbiome and, and a risk of developing obesity and type 2 diabetes because of uh, the disrupted microbiome, you, you cannot ask a nurse or, or a physician um, to, you know, to eat uh, um, after they've uh, been awake for an entire night just uh, uh, so they um, restore their gut microbiome uh, composition and function. So, so what we're trying to do is to decode the molecular mechanisms by which our microbes communicate with our host cells at different time points throughout the course of a day. And, and when we understand what goes wrong, what gets disrupted when um, the circadian rhythm is, is uh, disturbed, maybe we could develop new interventions that would enable the microbes to now correctly signal to the host and to avoid these risk behaviors and these uh, susceptibility to disease. If some of these microbes, they're, so, they're, so they're obviously sensitive to the, the feeding fasting period, so food intake versus not eating. What about the composition of the food? Like, does that play a role? Does that matter in addition to, you know, some of these these microbe um, species that are that are you know active uh, on their diurnal circadian rhythm? 
I, I think that of all the different environmental factors that um, affect us humans um, uh, and, and surround us, uh, um, our stress levels, the medications we take, where we live and how we, we conduct our lives, the composition of the diet is probably the most important and most dominant factor which impacts our gut microbes. Um, and, and this has been shown by us in the Personalized Nutrition Project, but it has been extensively shown by many others. And, and, and I think it is safe to say that of all the features that we and others are studying, there's nothing more important and dominant than the composition of our diet. Well, let's talk a little bit, about, dive into that a little bit, like, you know, maybe starting with some of the macronutrients, like how do the composition of our diet, including proteins or carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates versus, you know, simple carbohydrates, um, or even fat and the type of fat, saturated fat versus polyunsaturated fat or monounsaturated fat. How does that affect, or whether we eat a plant-based diet, plant diet or animal-based diet, how does that affect the composition of our microbiome? Well, that's a great question. And, and to be honest, I think that our very young field is only beginning to mechanistically unravel uh, these complex effects. Um, and, and there are many different types of effects by which uh, micro and macronutrients in our diet could impact our microbes. Uh, for example, some um, of our um, nutritional inputs could serve as, as an energy source to microbes. And some microbes would preferentially digest uh, some, uh, but not other, uh, um, components of our diet. So, so there is, um, um, as, as you may imagine, there may be a competitive advantage to some microbes over others, depending on the diet that they're exposed to. Um, other impacts could relate to um, an even more enigmatic part of the microbiome, which is bacterial-bacterial communications. And, and we increasingly know that we have trillions of bacteria in our gut, and these form ecosystems or communities in which there are very marked and poorly understood communication channels between different bacteria that determine who would survive, who would flourish, and who would not. And these also, um, in many interesting aspects, relate to signals that are obtained from our diet. And, and a third example of how diet composition could impact our microbes relates to the host. And, and many of our dietary components are sensed or are absorbed by the host, which changes its behavior uh, um, in response to these, com com uh, to these compounds. And the host uh, could be uh, you know, regarded as, as a very sophisticated incubator that houses all of these microbes. And by changing its behaviors or its conditions, uh, uh, the host in response to that could change uh, um, the, the relative composition and function of different microbes over others. What about you know, there's there there are there are people you know living in in you know certain parts of, for example, Africa that are, you know, they eat a very very, like from day to day the diet's very similar. Um, you know, they're eating lots of complex carbohydrates, for example. I mean, it's a very much they eat the same meals like almost every day. Um, versus someone living in like, you know, in the Western world and the United States, for example, where there's you know, the diets vary so much from person to person and depending on like processed foods versus, you know, eating whole foods, um, you know, how, how stable is the microbiome if, if, for example, we were to switch diets? So if someone in the Western world was to eat something more like, you know, plantains and, and these, you know, complex carbohydrates uh, and, and vice versa? Yeah, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, and the answer is that, that uh, it really depends on which resolution uh, you're looking at the microbiome in terms of its stability. So, so just to give you um, an example, if you look from, from a bird's eye view, way from, from up top um, at an adult person's microbiome, and, and you're talking about a healthy adult with a relatively stable uh, lifestyle, um, then the, the microbiome composition over time in that adult would seem very, very stable. Um, we, we discovered that even in, in industrialized nations, uh, people are usually exposed to no more than 40 or 50 components of, of, uh, of dietary, uh, um, dietary composition um, um, in, in a routine uh, lifestyle. So the variation in our individual exposure to food is much lesser than, than you would expect. Um, and if you just uh, you know, look into the composition and the function of the microbiome from, from this re resolution, you would find that it changes uh, um, very in a very minor manner between the age of three until we get uh, to an old age or if we develop disease or change our lifestyle. However, 
if you dive deeper into the microbiome, you would find that there are more interesting changes that are, um, you know, more subtle um, and, and characterize our healthy being. For example, um, there are studies in Africa looking into uh, rainy or dry seasons, which char are characterized by different exposures to different crops and different foods. And, and you can see that there's a very consistent and very reproducible change that, that is based on the changes in the in the, in the um, in these seasons and, and what they represent. If you look even closer, as, as we just discussed, um, even in a 24-hour cycle, you, you would find that the microbiome is what we call stably unstable. It is stable, but um, it oscillates throughout a 24-hour cycle in a very reproducible manner. Uh, and this uh, relates to a healthy state. Now, when you start adding into it um, all the perturbations and all the exposures that, that a human may be uh, um, experiencing, for example, uh, changes in diet, as you highlight, um, changes in where we live, changes in our health status, in our stress status, in the medications that we eat, all of these environmental signals or cues reflect on our gut microbes in a way that may impact our physiology or risk of developing diseases. What do you think about, for example, uh, a vegetarian diet versus someone, you know, it's become, it's become quite popular actually in the United States, uh, uh, this carnivore diet where people actually uh, cut out all carbohydrates and they eat only meat. How is that going to impact the microbiome or do we know? Yeah, th there are very uh, elegant studies early on from, from, from the kind of birth of the field uh, by researchers such as uh, uh, Jeff Gordon and Fred uh, Beckhead, um, um, which have shown that, um, you know, if you abruptly change the composition of the diet um, from one type to another, for example, from a veggie to a carnivore diet, uh, um, you very reproducibly change in an average, in a population average, you, you very uh, reproducibly change the composition of the microbe into one which accommodates better the new diet. And this is kind of uh, uh, when you look at a relatively low resolution into the microbiome. However, if you look at a higher resolution, and this I think was one of the exciting discoveries that we came across in the personalized nutrition project, you would find that even within the same diet, people react very differently uh, uh, when you look closely enough. Um, so, so, so the answer is, is a complex one. You know, in, in 2015, we've conducted our own uh, kind of mini uh, trial in which we took a group of uh, healthy human individuals and we've asked them politely to eat only white rice for a week, then only, uh, you know, a steak for another week, while we extensively measured them uh, for their microbiome. And we found indeed that the microbiome changes in a very reproducible manner, even if the starting configuration is different between people, the direction of, of the change is very uh, um, similar um, when you look at the same bacteria in different people uh, with respect to their response to the same dietary change. Uh, but when you look at the, at the more real life scenario, you would find that people are uniquely responding to, to dietary components, even if they're exposed to the same exact diet. And this is the hallmark of the personalized nutrition approach. What role does microbiome diversity play in, for example, the you know metabolic responses to food like postprandial post glucose response or um, you know, in when it comes to our personalized responses to diet? Well, well, if you're looking at, or if you're thinking about uh, microbial diversity or, or the, the richness of, of a given microbiome, there are many interesting observations that um, try to re that are trying to relate um, the loss of diversity to a propensity to develop disease. So, for example, if you look at indigenous populations of humans, uh, hunter gatherers and so on and so forth, you would find um, in some studies that the diversity of their microbiome can be tenfold higher than the average diversity that we um, um, can see and measure um, in, in the same human beings when they live in modern, quote unquote, uh, societies or industrialized societies. And, and, and people have tried to link this uh, um, amazing reduction in diversity to the modern uh, risk of developing uh, diseases such as um, obesity, type 2 diabetes, fatty liver, and even cancer and other diseases. Um, however, the causal role implicating the richness per se of the microbiome to these diseases still merits further investigation. So the jury is still out there. 
although I must say that in many, many microbiome associated diseases, we indeed see a reduction in diversity that characterizes uh, um, these uh, disease states. Uh, whether the diversity reduction is by itself a risk factor to the development of disease or whether it just reflects the emergence of dominant disease causing microbes is an open question that at least to my opinion has not been sufficiently answered uh, yet. Speaking about the diversity and how it changes, um, I, the question is how it changes throughout the lifespan. So you mentioned, you know, a few minutes ago about the microbiome being pretty stable, uh, generally speaking, at, you know, after the age of about three. Um, so kind of, this is a two-part question. One would be, you know, what factors, like it seems as though during early development, it would be very important if, if that's, you know, if you're shaping the overall general stability of the gut microbiome in the first three years of life. What impact, you know, for example, feeding your infant and young young child, you know, breast milk, which has things like human milk oligosaccharides and a variety of factors that are that have been shown to be very important for the gut microbiome and shaping it. And then also, you know, what foods you do feed your child or antibiotic use or factors like that. Um, do you think that it that parents should be focused somewhat on the the health of their young young growing child's you know gut microbiome in those first three years of life, or exposing them to, for example, you know, soil and and other you know bacterial um, exposures that they're getting from their environment? I, I think that the data we have uh, certainly um, points toward that direction. So so there's um, lots of um, lots of uh, data emerging in animal models and also uh, quite a lot of data emerging in humans that suggest that the critical window of opportunity in the first three years of a human's life is the window in which we shape our adult configuration of the microbiome. And, and this uh, uh, window of opportunity is, is also a window of risk, um, um, is, is one in which um, you know, the, the microbiome can, can be influenced both by our parents and our immediate surroundings, but also by what we eat, what we're exposed to, and the amount of environment that our microbes sense. Uh, um, and, and this kind of brings a, a little bit of a paradox because we as humans were um, raised uh, in the last two centuries to, to be afraid of, of, of microbes and of, of infections, uh, which uh, justifiably were the leading cause of death in humans uh, for millions of years. But we, we now are slowly realizing that by overly protecting our children from exposure uh, um, to these uh, microbes that surround us in, in every, uh, um, you know, every material that, that surrounds a young child may predispose uh, um, to, to an underdevelopment of their microbiome. In other words, by subjecting uh, kids to an overly sterile condition, we may be harming them by not allowing their microbiome to shape uh, in a diverse enough manner that would train our immune system and, and, and would um, um, impact our um, healthy metabolism in a way that uh, would result in health uh, in years to come. And, and in, especially in mice, but also in, to some extent in humans, um, it, it was shown that uh, early life exposure to antibiotics, for example, uh, uh, could save lives in many cases, but the price that we may pay is an increased risk for dis diseases such as asthma. Th these are elegant studies that were performed by my friend and colleague, Brett Finley, and to uh, obesity in later life um, um, and, and, and other diseases. Uh, so, so, you know, the, the proof of causality, especially in human, in human uh, uh, patients is very hard to achieve, but it seems that the majority of evidence uh, from the decade and a half of microbiome research uh, uh, certainly points to that possibility and to that direction. I remember um, I have, my son is, is now four, but um, when, you know, when I was, uh, you know, a really new mother, I remember coming across a study where early life exposure within the first year to, to dirt like, you know, dirt and, and obviously the bacteria that are in the dirt, um, it seemed to be protective against later development of asthma was a big one. I think there was, um, you know, auto, an autoimmune type of, you know, response. And so I really, and, you know, as you mentioned, you know, we, we, this hygiene, you know, 
obsession that we have in the in industrialized nations, you know, which, you know, there there's a good rationale behind that. But, you know, we all live in these buildings and, you know, not many people have, you know, any dirt or trees or just, you know, you know, sand. And so um, you really, in some cases, have to make an effort to go out and expose your young child, you know, let them play in the dirt, let them get dirty. And so I definitely um, tried to do that as much as possible when, when my when my son was, you know, early, early during early development. So um, I, I, I totally agree. And, and, and this is supported, for example, by epidemiological um, um, evidence of, of some of the autoimmune or autoinflammatory diseases being much less prevalent in kind of you know, quote unquote, uh, uh, um, dirtier countries or, or countries in which um, um, the, the prevalence of exposure at early life to environmental infection is higher as compared to um, cleaner, quote unquote, uh, countries which suffer from an uh, from a marked increase in, in these autoimmune or autoinflammatory diseases. Um, they're, they're very elegant studies by my colleague, uh, um, um, Martin Blazer from, from NYU showing um, in mice and I think also in humans that, uh, um, that, that this uh, overly uh, um, uh, um, th th these, these distinct uh, um, depletion or, or changes on the development of the microbiome could impact on the susceptibility to develop uh, uh, diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease uh, uh, in later life. So, so this link certainly has been suggested and to some extent has been um, uh, demonstrated to probably occur. A formal proof of causality um, in diseases which may take many years and even decades to develop is very hard to achieve in humans. So there too, I think that the, the supporting evidence is, is, is very robust, but uh, in order to get a, a completely, um, you know, uh, 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 finalized uh, uh, proof, uh, you know, it will take more time. Do you, um, so the, the, the kind of, the question I have is like, is there, we're talking a lot about the environment and how that's shaping the gut microbiome. And it just sort of came to my mind, like, you know, there, there are some women, for example, that, you know, have IBD, ir irritable bowel disease or something uh, for, for whatever reason, I don't, you know, whatever the cause, causal factor is. Is there a genetic com com uh, component or something that can still influence the microbiome composition? Let's say that woman has a child and, you know, like, is there some sort of transgenerational effect of microbiome? Like what if, you know, this woman had a lot, maybe she's got IBD because she had cereal exposures to antibiotics combined with, you know, poor, poor meal timing or you know, who knows what the combination of, of environmental factors could have been to influence her microbiome. Does her, does the mother's microbiome affect the child's microbiome? Is there any evidence of that? Well, um, I, I would divide my answer in, into two parts. Uh, first of all, um, every child is born um, sterile to the best of our knowledge um, and acquires his or her microbiome during the neonatal period from uh, his or her immediate surrounding, which mainly consists of their parents who are very close to them. Um, so um, in addition to, to many other environmental factors, it seems that a child's uh, microbiome is very much um, influenced by that of their parents, um, and especially their mother in, in cases in which the mother, you know, takes more care of, of, of a baby than, than the father. Um, with that said, um, the question you're raising um, is, is a fundamental question in the microbiome field, uh, which if I were to rephrase, would um, um, ask whether the microbiome is shaped by our genes or by our environment. And, and this remained an open question for many years until we um, conducted um, an ambitious study in which we took 500 healthy individuals and we comprehensively profiled their microbiome and assessed as much as we could many of the environmental factors that influence them, including their dietary habits and so on and so forth. And we sequenced their genes. So we characterized their human genome. So for the first time, we could directly compare the influence of our human genome and our environment on the composition and the function of the microbiome, and also to compare the potential contribution of the microbiome and the human genes on different human traits? And the answer was an intriguing answer. What we found was uh, 
that most of the effect um, shaping our microbiome comes from the environment. Only 1.9% of the variability in the human microbiome could be explained by differences in the human genes, while close to 99% of the variability in the human microbiome was explainable by factors coming from people's environment. That doesn't mean that the 1.9% of the genes is not exceedingly important. There could be some genes there that are exceedingly and dramatically important in generating a healthy microbiome. It just tells you that the weight of the effect is mainly coming from the environment. And this is very encouraging because the environment, in contrast to our human genes, could be modulated. So if a microbiome changes for any reason to a configuration which favors disease, we could hopefully find ways by which we modify the environment that is sensed by the microbiome in order to reverse it back to a, uh, into a, a healthy configuration. The second um, um, revelation from this study was um, equally interesting to us. And, and what we found was that some human traits were only impacted by the human genes. So for example, if you look at human height, it is not affected by the microbes whatsoever. So almost all of the um, explanation for differences in human height came from the human gene and not from the microbes. However, when we looked at a number of metabolic parameters, such as weight, uh, waste to heat ratio, cholesterol levels, and many other metabolic features, we found that the microbes, the microbiome, and the human genes had independent and very substantial effects on these traits. In other words, the microbiome and the human body or the human genomic system participate in the de determination of our healthy metabolism and our risk of developing metabolic disease. I, I just, you brought up a question. I, I, I wanted to circle back to dietary composition because you've done so much work on that. But that what you just said brought up a, a question in my mind about cholesterol the microbiome having an independent effect on cholesterol, um, you know, we do, we do know that genetics plays a role as well. But do you know, is that, have you, have you or any of your colleagues looked into the mechanism for that or multiple, I guess, probably multiple mechanisms? I'm kind of thinking along the lines of even just inflammation um, and how, you know, when there's an inflammatory response, you know, you know, cholesterol is kind of produced, like that's kind of a well-known thing is that you should always have an, at least an N of two when you're getting your cholesterol levels measured because, you know, if you have some sort of stressful event or something that's causing inflammation or if you're sick, you can have, you know, high cholesterol levels. And that's not necessarily indicative of what is you know, your cholesterol levels are. You're absolutely right. And, and uh, I can tell you um, that we and several other groups have uh, reproducibly found that uh, different aspects of healthy cholesterol and uh, fatty acid metabolism in humans and in mice are modulated by the gut microbiome. So for example, in the personalized nutrition project and in interventional trials that were followed as part of this project, we found that modification of the personalized nutritional uh, um, recommendations could lead to an improvement in HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol. Um, another group from the UK um, um, conducted a very ambitious uh, follow-up trial uh, similar to the personalized nutrition project, uh, which we started with, uh, called the PREDICT trial. And in this trial, they could show something very exciting, which is that the microbiome and the host um, could use to predict a person's triglyceride levels. In other words, not only did they associate the microbes to uh, features of, of uh, fatty acid metabolism or uh, triglycerides, which, which are one of the risk factors for cardiovascular disease, they could use data coming from the microbiome in order to predict a person's levels of, of uh, triglycerides, which provides another stronger proof to the possible causal association between the two features. Do you think that some of the confounding factors in the many, many studies that have been done, for example, on saturated fat and, you know, the role of saturated fat in cardiovascular disease risk or in certain biomarkers that indicate cardiovascular disease risk, like high cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, for example. Do you think that, you know, there's, there are conflicting, there's conflicting data where it's, it's not always bad, but it, it does seem to be bad. So, um, is there a microbiome component like in, in, in the way your body responds to saturated fat? 
I, I think that you know the, the specific answer is I don't know, but the conceptual answer is that in every study that we look or conduct, we find that um, inter-individual differences in the microbiome could play a role and potentially explain variabilities between studies in their outcomes, even if they seemingly do the same thing and reach different conclusions. Um, and I can give you endless examples. Uh, for example, our own uh, um, studies on non-nutritive sweeteners or artificial sweeteners uh, um, suggested that the microbiome is a very major player that modifies uh, the response of some people, but not of, of other people um, into some of, of the nutrients. And, and if you look at the body of evidence suggesting that nutrients adversely or favorably impact the human body, you know, it's all over the place. And, and, and the results are very conflicting with each other and people, you know, spend their career fighting with each other while some of the explanations could lie within inter-individual variabilities in their physiology, including ones that are related to their microbiome. Since you mentioned the artificial sweeteners, um, maybe we can kind of dive into that just for a moment because it's it's fascinating work that you, your lab has done on um, the metabolic effects of, for example, artificial sweeteners, but also like food additives, emulsifiers. So you mentioned that that people had diverse responses to artificial sweeteners. Um, what were those responses like? Yes. You know. So so um, the study that we've published uh, um, mainly focused on mice. Um, and in mice, uh, we uh, studied several uh, artificial sweeteners, but we mainly focused on saccharin as, as a very marked example. And what we found to our very big surprise was that um, mice featured um, a counterintuitive disturbance in their glycemic responses when they were exposed to saccharin. And this was driven by their microbiome. So for example, when you uh, exposed mice to, to um, saccharin at different doses and took the microbiome after this exposure and transferred it into germ-free mice that never saw saccharin, they developed the same disturbances um, in blood sugar control as those of the donor uh, mice. And, and so this was a very complex study uh, um, that provided a proof of concept that some dietary compounds that we use, mainly modern dietary compounds that we regard as uh, inert because they don't seem to directly impact our body, may impact our body in peculiar ways indirectly through their effects on the microbiome. Um, and, and, and this, uh, I think, uh, proof of concept study was followed by many other studies. You, you uh, mentioned um, emulsifiers and, and there were studies on, on, on food colorants and, 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 and other uh, ingredients which may bear effects in some people based on, the, uh, on their impacts uh, mediated on the gut microbes. Um, and, and this needs to be taken into consideration when assessing the safety uh, and, and the um, inertness of such substances. Were the levels, I, I think I recall reading, the levels of the dietary emulsifiers were even perhaps in levels that were uh, relevant for humans? Yeah, and, and, and you know, uh, in, in some of the mouse studies, the levels were higher than in humans, but in many of them, the levels were, um, um, you know, very similar to the ones uh, uh, observed in humans. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to directly compare mice to humans. The metabolism is not exactly the same, and we need to say, um, um, you know, to say that uh, out loud. Um, the concepts um, in, in many cases are very similar, and the effects are very similar, but uh, mice are not humans. Um, but at least they suggest that um, such uh, impacts could be um, could be happening, and and you know the, the the burden of proof is on us. You know before we recommend a substance, we need to to make sure that at least sufficiently we we understand what it does to our microbes, what it does to our human body, to make sure that we do no harm. Um, so so not every mouse based study could be directly translated into humans, but many of them provide. Um, an intelligent hypothesis that needs to be ruled in or ruled out in human studies that follow. Well said. Were, were there any preliminary human studies that were followed up with, um, with the artificial sweeteners and or the emulsifiers? So with the artificial sweeteners, um, as part of the original study, we, we published a very preliminary small-scale study um, suggesting that personalized responses 
um, to uh, saccharin uh, in humans uh, do occur, and it could be even transferred upon microbiome transfers from human into humans into germ-free mice. This was a very small preliminary study um, that we and others are trying to follow up on in larger uh, controlled trials um, that I hope would, uh, would teach us on potential uh, uh, personalized effects and how we can anticipate them um, or predict them in ways which would keep the use safe while uh, you know letting people enjoy sweetness. Uh, but but um, I would certainly say that there is emerging evidence that the findings that we came up with um, are not only reproducible in multiple uh, animal models, uh, you know, starting from uh, flies and all the way to 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 mice, rats, and and so and, and piglets, uh, but they may be relevant to humans. The jury is still out there. This is a very young field. We'll wait for more results. Oh, if I can give you a suggestion, I think most people nowadays don't consume saccharin like they did 30, 20 years ago. Um, the big ones that I know a lot of people would be interested in in, in knowing um, whether or not they're affecting the microbiome in a uh, good or bad way or in, if they're neutral and their effects on metabolism as, as well would be some of the non-nutritive sweeteners that are from natural sources like stevia or the monk fruit extract. So if you yeah, guys yeah. are interested in looking at that, I think that you know the, many people um, would be very, very interested in, in, in that data as well because um, a lot of people we're, consume it. I, I can only say we're on it. Uh, stay tuned. Great. <laughs> Um, so we've been talking quite a bit about obesity throughout the podcast and how the gut microbiome is affecting obesity. Um, and I want to kind of dive into that a little bit more, but before we get there, I just have one question and I, I'm, I'm not sure it directly relates to your research. I know you've written about it in well, really well done review articles, um, that you've published it, the effects of omega-3 fatty acids on the gut, um, are super interesting. I'm I'm a big omega three fan, and I remember reading you know a couple of studies coming out that were very quite surprising to me how the omega three was affecting the gut microbiome in what I thought to be a positive way. Yeah, um, you know omega three is, is a classical example of of um, of a compound which has been suggested to be very beneficial to the human body um, in in different manners. Um, but it also bears a uh, surprising uh, uh, impact on the gut microbiome. And, and um, this needs to be taken into account in, in assessing the overall effect of these compounds on different people, because different people have different microbiomes. And, and, and so the effects um, on the different people's microbiomes could determine the different outcomes upon consumption of omega-3. So, so I, you know, th these are not my studies, but I can only tell you that in every single example of a food component or food additive that uh, uh, we've tested, and we've tested thousands of them in, in over 100,000 people that underwent our personalized nutrition uh, 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 pipeline or project, we found that people distinctly react to foods or food components or food additives, even if they're exposed to the same exact amounts of the same exact component. And this includes uh, uh, fatty acids, such as the ones that you've, you've, uh, you've been asking about. Um, and, 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 you know, we don't know exactly what the complex array of causes are that determine this individualized uh, uh, responsiveness to, to different foods. This is a huge black box, which we bypass computationally, but it seems to involve both factors related to the host, factors related to our lifestyle, and factors related to our microbiome. So it definitely seems like, you know, understanding understanding more of these environmental factors, including the microbiome composition is ex extremely important, especially for, um, you know, sort of illuminating the the conflicting data out there for, you know, you'll, you'll find all these studies where one thing's good for you, but then another study says it's bad for you. And, and you know, so it's, it's, it's definitely a lot more complicated than we originally thought. Um, but I want to kind of shift gears and talk a little bit more about obesity because you had a, a, a very recent study actually that was um, very interesting and looked at some of the um, potential mechanisms behind why um, people that are starting out overweight or obese go on some sort of dietary program to lose weight and yet 
they tend to gain that weight back um, quite easily. So um, can we talk a little bit about uh, some of that recent work? Uh, absolutely. And, and this, this uh, phenomenon, which um, is medically called recurrent obesity, but is more widely known as yo-yo obesity, um, characterizes up to 80% of all obese individuals worldwide. So this is the most common pattern of obesity uh, that we know of, um, yet we have very little clue on, on what drives it. And, and the pattern is, as, as you suggested, um, a person who gains weight for any reason and then goes on in one of many different diets that are out there. Um, um, and, and most diets are very efficient uh, in reducing weight in the short term because they involve caloric restriction. So that person diets on one of these many diets, loses weight back to his or her original uh, low body weight. But then within 12 months of successfully dieting, 80% of people go on to redevelop uh, obesity or regain all the weight that they've lost and even regain a little bit more than they originally had. And from cycle to cycle of obesity and dieting attempts, we seem to get more and more obese until we gain, we become um, formally obese. And, and this is exactly the pattern of recurrent or yo-yo obesity. Now, if we're trying to uh, or if we're starting to, to scrape the surface in understanding the molecular mechanism that uh, drive obesity, we know very little about this driving, uh, about this recurrent yo-yo uh, obesity uh, phenomenon. So we tried to study it in mice and, and we developed uh, um, three or four different animal models that recapitulate this recurrent obesity behavior in humans. In other words, uh, for example, we took uh, mice, we put them on a, on obesogenic diet. We, we gave them a diet rich in, in uh, fat and, and, and sugar. They gain weight. Then we switched them into a, a low fat diet. They dieted back to their original level. And then we re-exposed them for a second and a third and a fourth cycle. And what we could see was exactly the same phenomenon that is observed in humans. From cycle to cycle, mice seem to regain more and more weight even when they started from the exact same weight as never obese mice and were exposed to the same exact diet. This is the exaggerated weight regain that characterizes yo-yo obesity in humans. Now, in order to try and study and understand what the drivers of these behaviors are, we looked into tens of different parameters um, um, that uh, can be measured in mice after they successfully diet. To, to look for something in the mice following a successful diet that could store a bad memory of their previous obesity. And it seems that everything seemed to normalize after a successful diet. All the hormonal and the endocrine um, and the metabolic features that we could measure totally normalized after a successful diet other than the gut microbiome. When we measure the gut microbiome, it seemed to be persistently disturbed as though the mice were never dieted. It, it had a configuration which was very similar to the one that we observed during obesity. And when we took this um, um, microbiome that never normalized after a successful diet and transferred it into germ-free mice, these mice developed obesity and type 2 diabetes, meaning that this post-dieting microbiome stored um, a metabolic memory of past obesity that predisposed the mice to an exaggerated weight regain the next time they were exposed to an obesogenic diet. And when we probed even deeper into this memory microbiome, we found that um, it induced um, uh, this trait of exaggerated weight regain by altering its ability to degrade dietary compounds, which are called isoflavonoids. Normally, we found that isoflavonoids from diet are degraded by the microbiome to compounds which swim into adipose cells and, signaling, and signal to them to, um, to release more heat and store less fat when we uh, are exposed to um, an obesogenic diet. Um, but when these compounds were missing after a successful diet, the adipose cells, the, the fat cells, were no longer given the signal to release heat and not to store fat. And now they were storing more fat and making the mice more obese as compared to non-yo-yo obesity mice. Um, in other words, the microbiome was driving this exaggerated weight regain 
tendency by changing its metabolism of distinct molecules coming from our diet. If I remember correctly, um, some of these distinct molecules were these flavonoids like apigenin, which is high in, for example, parsley and uh, narinogen, narinogenin, um, or narinogenin, I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's from grapefruit, really, essentially. And um, so, so there's bacteria that are degrading or metabolizing these flavonoids and the, the bacteria, there's, a, there's a, the, the obesity is, is causing a decrease in these types of bacteria. Is that correct? Exactly. So, so the bacteria normally actually generate these flavonoids from more complex flavonoids uh, by, by chemically modifying them. Once um, um, this uh, obesity and then successful dieting occurs, the change in the microbiome that is so persistent means that the microbes are no longer able to generate these compounds. And this leads to a cascade of events that results in more fat accumulation uh, per given diet, uh, leading to exaggerated uh, weight regain. So do you think then that perhaps consuming foods high in some of these compounds like grapefruit or and or supplementation would help with that? Uh, if your microbiome is not producing those compounds, but you need those compounds, is that correct? Am I understanding that correctly? The, the, it's not that the microbiome is not producing the compounds, it's that the, the microbes that are degrading these compounds are expanded in these obesogenic conditions. And, and therefore, there's more de degradation of these compounds and less of them that survive uh, this microbial activity. Um, and, and, and indeed, at least in mice, what we've found was that if we intervened by resupplementing uh, uh, mice with these now missing metabolites, we could avoid or treat exaggerated weight regain and, and the obesity that it induces. Um, um, a different approach that we've used in mice and seem to be highly effective is the replacement of this bad memory microbiome with a microbiome that had the, um, the, the ability to generate the right compound. Um, and, and by fecal microbiome transplantation, at least in mice, we could reset the mice to not develop uh, this yo-yo obesity phenotype. Um, so it seems that by understanding the molecular mechanism that drives obesity in these distinct states, one could intervene through the microbiome, or uh, at least in mice, and reverse this tendency and therefore treat obesity or ameliorate obesity, uh, at least in these contexts. Do you have any plans to look in humans, for example, um, that you could give them a supplement with these, with these flavonoids to see if that, how that affects the, the metabolic outcome? It's not only plans, it's, it's, it's an ongoing trial that, that um, um, is aimed at uh, utilizing the many pipelines that we've developed in mice uh, to measure these effects and to measure uh, um, the possible microbiome impacts on recurrent obesity and to study them in humans. Of course, humans are a much more complex animal than, than mice, but uh, many of the concepts seem to hold also in humans. Um, so we're studying this and trying to understand what happens in humans, which are the bugs and the molecules that they secrete, which may contribute to this bad microbial memory that we have identified in mice and how we can intervene in humans through different approaches, including metabolite supplementation that would reverse or treat uh, a recurrent obesity in humans. That's very exciting. I look, I eagerly wait for those, uh, for the, for the data. Um, you mentioned that people that are, you know, can, su can successfully lose weight by you know, a variety of diets. And a lot of them have to do with caloric restriction. In other words, they're just eating less food, um, and, and how that's, you know, that helps with weight loss. What effect does caloric restriction have on the gut microbiome? I, I think that it's very interesting um, to note that um, just like um, the, the findings that we and many others after us have noted with respect to um, recurrent obesity uh, um, and its effect on the microbiome and downstream metabolism, um, equally interesting studies that have recently came out that suggest that caloric restriction may um, have a peculiar effects on the microbiome that may drive its beneficial effects. Um, there, there are many uh, studies suggesting that uh, periodic uh, food restrictions, such as you know those 16A diets and, and many others, uh, may have beneficial metabolic effects. Uh, although you know um, the jury is still out there, I need to be careful. Uh, some studies have 
have been uh, showing less impressive results. Uh, but at least um, um, some of the effects may be mediated by the microbiome. Certainly, we see in these studies um, that um, caloric restriction or periodic uh, avoidance of food has distinct uh, changes on the microbiome, and these may contribute to different metabolic outcomes that are measured in these studies. I want to talk a little bit about you know, we just touched on it in a, mo a moment ago about our, our gut microbiome being these little factories that are churning out different compounds and metabolites. I think it's it's referred to by you and others as the microbiome metabolome. Yeah. Can you talk it's, about maybe just a couple of, you know, they're 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 producing compounds that could be beneficial in some cases, as as um, we've talked about, but also compounds uh, that may not be so beneficial. Uh, absolutely, and, and there are increasing uh, evidence um, suggesting um, that one may regard our microbiome, among many other uh, uh, descriptions, as, as a biochemical factory that generates or modulates many thousands of small molecules that could be potentially bioactive and are called metabolites. And and what we find uh, super interesting about these me metabolites or these small molecules is a that they have. Uh, in many cases, uh, um, a peculiar chemistry, you know, uh, that, that we've uh, not recognized uh, before, and and B that these molecules, in contrast to the microbes that make them, can influ can influx can can swim into our sterile body, where they can reach a very distant um, cells and organs and impact them, and and by understanding the unique physiology or the unique uh, effect of these small microbial uh, um, secreted molecules, one can start to understand how some microbiomes that live in one place could impact health and disease processes that occur miles away. For example, gut microbes impacting the brain or the joints. Um, and, and many of these effects could, could be mediated by these small bioactive molecules. Um, in fact, we and others have measured the, the small molecule per repertoire in peripheral blood of both animals and humans and it seems that around 50% of all small molecules that are found within our peripheral blood may originate in one way or another or be modulated in one way or another by our gut microbes. So it, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big thing. It's a, it's a big story because, because it means that our microbes could be regarded as a neglected organ that has very distant effects uh, um, that were not previously anticipated. I think... Most people that have um, that are that you know listen or watch our watch our podcast are familiar with some of the beneficial metabolites that are produced, like these short chain fatty acids, like butyrate or uh, propionate, acetate. Um, but and and their effects on on modulating the immune system. And and, and I think there's been just overwhelming ev evidence at this point that there's a role in these short chain fatty acids for you know playing signaling molecule role where they um, affect T, re T regulatory cell activity and or production, for example. What about uh, the flip side of that, about compounds that are produced um, by bacteria in our gut that are not beneficial and, and what role, for example, like leaky gut or, you know, what would be more um, technically intestinal permeability? some compounds that can be, you know, produced or this concept of metabolic endotoxemia, endo, endotoxemia, for example, maybe what uh, role that could play in even cardiovascular disease risk? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and it leads to, to an observation made by uh, clinicians a decade before, decades before we, we knew there was a microbiome or appreciated the potential magnitude of the effect of the microbiome on, on human health. And, 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 and this relates to the um, ability of the gut to withstand the huge antigenic and foreign molecule burden um, that it sees every day in the form of food and um, the trillions of microbes that are in the intestine, intestinal lumen and are you know, uh, uh, separated from our sterile cells by only a, a single layer of intestinal epithelial cells. Um, and, and throughout evolution, um, our, our human body has developed um, amazing means to um, kind of uh, uh, provide 
uh, this protection from invasion uh, of, of foreign uh, molecules into our sterile body while preserving the ability of our intestines to absorb food or food molecules, which is uh, totally critical uh, uh, for our uh, existence. What we observed for, for many decades was that this healthy leakiness of, of the gut that enables us to absorb food is disrupted in some disease context leading to an altered ability to withstand uh, or to separate uh, these foreign uh, uh, um, uh, objects or these foreign molecules, um, which now penetrate into the human body and they ignite, they turn on the immune system in ways which lead to disease. And, and this leaky gut or this, this altered gut permeability, as we call it, seems to constitute a common denominator factor, which is um, found in many disease states, such as heart disease, uh, many cancers, many autoimmune disorders. Um, and, and, and for many years, we, we did not understand um, the precise mechanisms by which this leaky gut forms and what the consequences of this uh, leakiness are on human health. Um, uh, in the last decade, there's been a lot of research uh, focused on uh, trying to understand uh, uh, this important concept. Uh, what we've contributed was an understanding that diverse molecules that are secreted by gut microbes are critically important in determining the normal state of leakiness that allows us to absorb food on the one hand, but blocks uh, um, um, all the, the foreign molecules that we don't want in our body from entering the body under normal circumstances. And once um, the conditions arise that lead to the disruption of this normal barrier function, um, which leads to leakiness, then this leakiness results in um, the um, influx of molecules from the gut into the sterile human body, which contribute to uh, disease states or to exacerbation of disease in different contexts. Um, so so uh, it's just another important mechanism by which our microbes could lead to an um, increased disease susceptibility or to new uh, um, severe symptoms in a previously present disease based on their effects on the gut barrier. What do you think the main contributing factor, environmental factors to, you know, this, this quote unquote leaky gut or, you know, this, you know, disrupting the balance, you know, of the gut barrier where, you know, you're, you're, you're basically your immune cells are now sort of having contact with the bacteria in the gut and it's causing this immune response. Like, do you, what are the main, like a couple of the top main environmental factors that cause yeah, that? Yeah. It's a great, it's a great question, and 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 we need to understand that the this barrier which we refer to is also a very complex um, structure, and it is composed of the uh, aligning cells of the of the gut, the the epithelial cells of the gut, which are characterized by very um, very specific connections to one another, which are tightly regulated, and these tightly regulated connections between the cells uh, um, could be influenced by molecules that come from food. They could influence by molecules uh, um, that come from the microbes. And once uh, this regulation is disrupted, then leaky gut occurs. A second uh, uh, part of the barrier is the mucus layer that overlays um, these lining epithelial cells. And the mucus layer in the gut is exceedingly important in separating the bacteria and the food molecules from physically attaching to our human side, to the epithelial cells. And, and it is increasingly shown that the generation and the preservation of this protective mucus is also regulated by a number of bacterial and environmental factors, such as medications, toxins, uh, um, and food components. So the more we learn, the more we realize that these protection barrier related processes are intriguingly impacted by the environment and by relays of the environment on our gut microbes. Do you think the food composition component is something that is, you know, more of an individualized, there's an individualized response to that that could affect the gut permeability? Or is there some general, 
phenomenon, like, you know, too much sugar in combination with saturated fat, for example, you called this an obesogenic diet. I, I think that, uh, you know, the more we look, the more personalized uh, uh, we see that the effects are. So just to give you an example of one food component that, that would impact some humans, but not others. Uh, um, let, let's talk about celiac disease, right? Celiac disease mediated uh, by, by proteins that are uh, present um, in, 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 in certain uh, uh, crops. Uh, for example, gliadin is, is, is the major protein uh, that is, is a part of bread. It, what makes our dough sticky and what makes our bread tasty. And in individuals that suffer from uh, a genetic susceptibility to develop immune reactivity to, to this protein, then um, a cascade of immune reaction occurs that leads, among many other changes, to a leaky bowel or to a leaky gut, which contributes to disease state um, in the celiac patients. So, so this is, a, 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 I think, a nice example of host genetic risk factors combining with food uh, components that, that these uh, uh, at-risk individuals are exposed to that lead to a clinical manifestation of disease, in this case, celiac. But I think this is just the, the tip of an iceberg, and many of the complex diseases that we call uh, uh, multifactorial diseases because we don't know what causes them, such as heart disease, and even maybe some cancers are caused by a combination of genetic risk factors coming from within the body and food and microbial components that contribute to a second heat, which leads to the clinical manifestations of these diseases. One could argue also that the lack of a dietary composition or lack of a, a type of food could also play a role as well. And I think a, a big one there would be, you know, these, uh, what I'd like you to kind of dive into a little bit, but the, the fermentable fiber. And so there's, there's the prebiotic, the probiotic, which most people are familiar with, and then there's the postbiotic. Can you describe the differences between these? Yes. So, so, um, these are kind of terms that, that are aimed to simplify the, the different, um, or some of the different interventions which are heavily researched in the young microbiome field in trying to modulate the microbiome and its interactions with the human body in, in, in trying to, to generate new treatment. So, so prebiotic interventions are um, classically uh, defined as, as food related um, interventions that are uh, composed of dietary uh, fibers that are aimed to quote unquote, make our microbiome healthier, whatever that means. Um, I think that our personalized nutrition approach is, is a more data-driven development of this prebiotic intervention. A probiotic intervention is one which involves the supplementation of exogenous microbes that we hope would um, um, be welcomed by our indigenous microbiome and impact our uh, body in, in a favorable manner. And a postbiotic therapy is one which utilizes these small bioactive molecules, which I've mentioned before, these metabolites. And, and once we understand uh, uh, whether uh, a metabolite uh, is missing in some disease context, now we can supplement this missing metabolite by a postbiotic therapy, thereby bypassing the entire microbiome or the entire microbial uh, ecosystem, which is so difficult to intervene because of uh, inter-individual variability. So that's postbiotic therapy. And on top of it, one could add other interventions such as the uh, fecal microbiome transplantation, uh, fate therapy, and other uh, eradication therapies that are being developed and, 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 and more uh, interventions that are uh, being uh, explored. I do want to get into phage therapy in a moment, but before we go there, um, you, your your lab has sh has published some some research that has or some data that has indicated or suggested that probiotics or supplementation with probiotics um, may work for some individuals, but perhaps not others. Why? Why? What was the mechanism for that? Why is that? Yeah, so, so like anything uh, or almost anything that we study, uh, especially in humans, uh, we find that um, the, the indigenous microbiome and its distinct inter-individual uniqueness plays major unappreciated roles in determining um, uh, many of our uh, microbiome-dependent health outcomes. So, so when we studied uh, uh, probiotics or, or we studied 11 different types of, of commonly prescribed over-the-counter probiotics, um, and we studied them both in mice and in humans in, in probably the most invasive microbiome study performed to date, we found that 
in around half the people that we've tested, um, when, when they take these probiotic uh, um, um, bacteria and supplement them into their diet, the probiotics are met with a very hostile microbiome, indigenous microbiome, which does not let them colonize our gut, even temporarily. So you take these probiotics in these cases, and they end up very rapidly from one end to the other. And by, by sampling these uh, volunteer uh, participants um, by invasive colonoscopy and endoscopy uh, uh, at different stages of, of probiotic uh, exposure, we could find that in individuals that um, consume probiotics but are not able to colonize these exogenous bugs along their gut, we could see absolutely no impact on the uh, gut uh, um, re responsiveness to these exogenous probiotics. However, in the other half of the individuals, the microbiome was much more welcoming. And when they were eating the probiotics, the probiotics, at least temporarily, were able to colonize along their guts. And in these individuals, we saw that these um, exogenous microbes indeed had quite significant impacts on uh, uh, our measurements of, of human responsiveness, uh, at least in the gut. That tells you that even the colonization of exogenous probiotics is highly individualized and is mainly determined by the composition and the function of the indigenous microbiome and how it welcomes these new uh, microbes that come into the neighborhood. I have about three follow-up questions uh, for you on, on this. So for one, is there is it known what exactly the, you know, what's regulating this, um, whether or not there's, you know, residential space or space made available for probi supplemental probiotics to colonize? Is it is it just the types of bacteria that are a little bit friendlier to say, yeah, you can come stay here? Or are there other factors that also regulate whether or not there's any residential space available? This is a great question. And the more we answer, the more we realize that this interaction between different microbes, whether they're members of the indigenous microbiome or members of the microbiome meeting these exogenous uh, probiotics, uh, the, the, the nature of these interactions is highly complex and poorly understood and is probably composed of many different ways of interaction. Sometimes um, um, the microbes just compete for space or compete for food. So if one microbe is more adept in eating the food um, at the expense of another, then it would expand and would not let the other thrive. Um, another uh, a potential set of interactions uh, are mediated by uh, the secretion of what we call antimicrobial peptides, which are these types of natural antibiotics which some microbes are able to secrete, which inhibit others. So you can see that some of these uh, uh, interactions are very hostile, while others could be very supportive in, in providing nutrients by one microbe that would enable the survival of another. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a whole big zoo of interactions that we're just trying and starting to unravel. But the one take home message which we've already discovered, and, and this was quite shocking to us, was that both in the human and the mouse setting, when you disrupt the indigenous microbiome by the administration of antibiotics, for example, you kind of empty out the neighborhood and now you give probiotics. Now the neighborhood is empty and the probiotics are no longer met by resistance, and now they can colonize the gut. But the result of this colonization is not always positive. And what we've discovered was that in people who were given probiotics together with antibiotic uh, uh, um, administration, which is a very common practice around the world in the US for sure, the probiotics were now able to colonize the gut because the indigenous microbiome was at least temporarily eradicated by the antibiotics. But now these probiotics were very persistently inhibiting the return of the indigenous microbiome after antibiotic uh, exposure was, was, was uh, no longer present. In other words, by giving probiotics together with antibiotics, we may be protecting uh, some individuals from the adverse effects associated with antibiotic treatment, but the price that we may pay is the creation of a chronic disturbance in the composition of our gut microbiome with the microbiomes, with the, with the probiotics very aggressively um, refusing to leave the neighborhood and colonizing the once diverse gut and not letting the microbiome uh, repopulate and recolonize. And this could have long-term effects 
um, in, in, in predisposing individuals to chronic diseases, which we and many others uh, are researching. And, and this tells you that probiotics, uh, we're not against probiotics. We're just uh, very much in favor of studying them in, in a very comprehensive manner in order to make sure that we understand their functions, their personalized effects, and their possible long-term influences, whether they're good or bad, on human subjects. I guess there's a lot of questions that that also do arise from from that data, um, including you know the indigenous microbiome composition before the antibiotic treatment, for example. Perhaps it was not a good one. Um, so then you wonder, well, maybe I don't want some of those bacteria to be you know in inhabiting my my gut again, um, or perhaps you know uh, the the timing and the quantity of the probiotics. So maybe you shouldn't just be overwhelming your gut constantly with them, but maybe, you know, if you want just to seed a little bit of some of these bifidobacteria or some, some bacteria that um, may be beneficial, uh, is that something that you've, you guys are looking into or ha are thought about? I, I totally agree. I, I don't think that these results per se, you know, tell, tell you anything definitive that, that is a take-home message. Uh, it tells you that we need to be careful until we know better. Um, but it also tells you that potentially, um, you know, if you could combine antibiotics with probiotics in a, in a, in a diseased microbiome setting, then, then they could potentially be beneficial. You know, could get rid of a disease associated or a disease causative microbiome, replace them with uh, probiotics uh, um, to, 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 to keep the niche uh, uh, occupied. And then maybe you'll, you'll do something good to diseases. All I'm saying is, that we need research and we need evidence. And I, I oppose, you know, careless uh, um, manufacturing of, of probiotics just because they don't impact the taste of food. Uh, um, and, 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 and our and other people's research suggests that what we call precision probiotics or next generation probiotics may be bugs that don't smell the best. Maybe they're not the, the tastiest bugs, but they may be most effective in colonizing the human gut and and, and positively impact our health in different contexts. Um, we just need to understand how they do it, to tailor them to the individual, and to make sure that they're safe. Two questions to follow up on that. Do you think that, one, the amount or the dose of probiotic or the colony forming units, for example, can play a role in whether or not a probiotic can colonize, if there's any at all? Um, and two, um, do you think that these probiotics, perhaps they're not colonizing, but they're exerting a therapeutic effect as they are flowing through the gut, and particularly in people with a disease like colitis or inflammatory bowel disease or something, um, obviously, that would be uh, a, a disease that originates in the gut? Um, do you think there would be a benefit, even if the probiotic is not colonizing, but just the fact that you are flow through and it's helping a person um, with with some uh, gut issues? That's a, that's a good question. And I can tell you uh, um, that our, at least in, in, in the strains that we've tested, uh, we've given the, the volunteer participants uh, um, quite heavy doses of, of these probiotics. So, so when they were not colonizing, they were not colonizing. And, and, and we are the first to study this colonization pattern, not in stool, which, which is where most of the previous studies have, have looked into uh, probiotics. Uh, we found that the stool is, is, is very problematic in assessing colonization because even in people who do not colonize at all uh, with probiotics, you know, they end up accumulating in stool because that's the natural way where they go. Uh, um, so you need to really sample inside the gut in order to understand whether a person colonizes or not. So, so in the people who did not colonize, even when we gave them high doses of, of these preparations, we could observe absolutely no colonization, even when uh, assessing it by very, very, very sensitive means along the gastrointestinal tract. Now, whether they could have some effect uh, uh, when they're, you know, flying through the lumen all the way to, to, to where they end up, putatively maybe, but, but it's, in my view, very unlikely. Uh, you're talking about uh, um, uh, about bugs that, that secrete molecules that are kind of dis uh, dispersed in an ocean, you know, they're diluted in an ocean. And, 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 and to think that they would be physiologically effective when in the middle of the ocean, you know, is at least theoretically possible, but I think the burden on proof of, of proof is on those who claim it. My um, 
my hunch or my assumption is that most of the effect that one would see from uh, uh, from exogenous bacteria, for for example, from precision probiotics, would be expected to exert along the mucosal surfaces where the microbes meet the epithelial cells, where they adhere to the epithelial cells or to the mucus layer, and and where the distances are such that secreted molecules could reach their destination without having to pass through this giant ocean. Yeah, I mean, that definitely makes a lot of sense. I, perhaps there's a role for dose in in the bacteria uh, having any any sort of therapeutic effect as flow through. I know there, I've personally, you know, read a, a, a quite a few studies on a certain um, very um, high dose probiotic over 400 billion bacteria. The it, many of the studies at the time they were the bacteria it was um, the brand was called VSL number three, and um, and then it was like re re uh, another the formulation was like done again and it was called Visbiome, but uh, many of the publications, clinical studies, you know, including as well as uh, animal studies, but there there have been benefits, for example, on like colitis or irritable bowel syndrome with taking um, for either 400 or 800, you know, colony forming units. So like, you know, 800 billion. So h- much higher doses than you would find in something on the shelf of a, a grocery store. Um, and again, it might just be, you know, a very transient effect that's happening um, you know, preventing diarrhea, for example, when you're when you're taking a high dose probiotic or something like that. But um, I, I cannot rule it out, but I respect respectfully disagree that the level of evidence is even close to one which would um, make me recommend uh, these for IBD or for any disease. And, and and the evidence is that not a single probiotic preparation to date has been approved as a medical intervention by the FDA or by the European counterparts of the FDA. So uh, again, I'm not against probiotics, but I think that the, just like any human in medical intervention, probiotics should be assessed by evidence-based medicine and proven to be effective in certain preparations, certain doses, certain medical conditions, and not assumed to be effective before we test them and we pour, we, before we prove them. Well, you mentioned something earlier about the combination of perhaps even uh, probiotics with bacteriophage uh, or a com- combination of antibiotics with bacteriophage. Can you explain to people what bacteriophages are? Absolutely. So so bacteriophages are intriguing viruses um, that in contrast to the viruses that we all, uh, you know, suffer from these days are viruses that do not infect humans and they do not infect any um, mammals or any eukaryotic cells. These are viruses that only infect bacteria and only attack bacteria. And um, these uh, viruses are exceedingly uh, common in nature. You can find many, many uh, uh, types uh, of these uh, viruses um, in our environment. And in fact, these viruses are the big enemies of the bacteria that surround us. So there is kind of an arms race between bacteria and these bacteriophages, which attack bacteria, with the phages trying to kill bacteria and the bacteria developing uh, a means of defending themselves against these viruses. Uh, it's an intriguing arms race, which led to some groundbreaking discoveries, such as CRISPR, uh, which is the, you know one of these uh, uh, defense mechanisms, which has been now massively exploited by uh, science in order to um, genome edit, uh, for example, uh, uh, genes of interest. Um, so, so this is this is what occurs in nature. What we and others um, are thinking uh, about uh, in, in utilizing phages is that um, you know we have a huge unmet need in the microbiome field. Imagine that you find a member, a, a, a microbe, a bacteria in the microbiome which um, contributes to disease, contributes to IBD, contributes to cancer. What do you do? How do you get rid of these bacteria without harming the entire microbial surrounding uh, um, that is so important for our health. Um, antibiotics are a very limited manner of doing this. Uh, antibiotics are nonspecific. They have big adverse effects. They result in the emergence of resistant strains. So, so you cannot use antibiotics forever for, for your entire life. And, and many of the disease-causing bacteria in the microbiome are antibiotic resistant. So what do you do? We have a, really an unmet need uh, um, in having no means of, of taking out 
a microbe from the microbiome when we want to um, eliminate its bad effect. And so we thought that phages could represent an attractive means of attacking a bacteria without impacting the entire microbiome because phages are very specific in their targets. Uh, a given phage would only attack a certain family of bacteria that has uh, a receptors which the phage recognizes. Um, now, I told you before that bacteria in, as part of this arms race have developed very strong defense mechanisms against phages. So if you give just one phage, it is very likely that the bacteria it would attack would generate defense mechanisms that would make it resistance against, resistant against this uh, phage and, and so your therapy would not be successful. So what we are doing, we are generating cocktails of phages that are targeting the same bacteria through different receptors or different mechanisms and together these phages are killing the bacteria without an, allowing it to develop this antiphage defense system. Uh, um, and, and if this is successful and we're now in the midst of clinical trials, we would be able to really take a, a needle out of the haystack by targeting a single bacteria or a single type of bacteria without killing the entire microbiome and causing uh, a substantial collateral damage. I didn't, I wasn't aware that uh, the, the bacteria in, were developing these defense mechanisms, kind of, you can think about it, you know, uh, the, as similar to like antibiotic resistance in a way, I guess. Um, but what are your what are your thoughts about then perhaps a future where we have this targeted type of treatment where in in addition to maybe your bacteriophage cocktail that's targeting maybe you know one or perhaps two of the pathogenic type of bacteria and then combining them with a commensal type of bacteria um, in in terms of you know allowing this pre precision probiotics in a way, uh, perhaps, I don't know, maybe there's another name for it, but where you're actually allowing the uh, the types of bacteria that we know are commensal that maybe perhaps these people are not, are lacking. And um, this is a way to actually get them to be colonized. Uh, absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm, I, I totally agree with, with what you suggest. And, and I think, um, you know, at, at the very young microbiome field, we're at the stage of understanding more and more of these interactions and, and the roles of different bugs and their communication systems, and also are increasingly busy in generating these new uh, treatment options that hopefully would be put on the clinical shelf in years to come. But I am totally uh, with you uh, with the prospect that these new interventions would be combined with each other in contributing to what we call uh, personalized or precision medicine. In other words, I, I, I would speculate that exactly as you suggest, um, a phage cocktail that would eradicate a, a family of bacteria from the microbiome uh, would be successfully combined with um, a probiotic or maybe a, a precision or next generation probiotic, which would have the ability to colonize in a given person and would replace the niche uh, I'm now freed from, from this disease uh, uh, um, contributing a microbe. So, so a combination between probiotics and phages, between dietary interventions that would uh, enable better probiotic uh, um, activity and so on and so forth are what I anticipate uh, for our future. What do you think the potential timeline would be on, on this, you know, ultimately replacing some of our current um, ways of like antibi antibiotic treatment, for example, which is a very blunt sort of, you know, uses a very blunt mechanism. As you mentioned, it wipes out everything, good and bad bacteria. Yeah, I mean, when we criticize antibiotics, we need to be very careful. Uh, uh, you know, antibiotic uh, uh, interventions have, have amazingly transformed human lives, human health, human medicine. You know, they, they increased, I think, close to 30 years uh, of, of lifespan within a century and, and, and at least partially took care of, of what is considered to be our number one, two, and three uh, cause of mortality uh, for millions of years. Uh, however, as, as we discussed previously, uh, antibiotics are, are also associated with many prices that we pay, and we're just beginning to appreciate what they do to our microbiome. Um, I, I don't think that um, the current uh, uh, medical interventions would be replaced, but I'm very hopeful that we would be able to implement them with uh, new precision data-driven approaches that would enable to increase the efficacy uh, uh, of these treatments and to be combined with them. As to the timelines, you know, with, with, you know th there is quite a, 
hyper or overhype with, with the very young microbiome field. And, and partially it's justifiable because, you know, in a, in a matter of a decade and a half, we've discovered that uh, our human body, uh, in addition to the 20 something thousand genes that uh, are encoded in our human cells, also contain 3 million and more bacterial genes uh, um, that we didn't appreciate and we didn't know anything about. Uh, um, so, so this is for sure, at least in my view, a, a revolution, but we're only at the beginning of, of understanding this, this new world. Um, remember that, you know, it took decades for, for cardiology to get to a point where, um, you know, catheterization and, and all the fancy interventions that are saving lives today have been uh, matured and, and developed uh, for clinical use. We're only talking about a very infant field, uh, lots of research, lots of advances, but also lots of, of, of challenges. I, I don't want to give a, a time estimate, but I'm hopeful that within the next decade, we will start to see some interventions maturing in a data-driven way uh, into the clinical shelf. That would be great. What what role do you think, or what role does the so-called virome play in, in human health? And do you think that science may yet find that viruses modulate health in a possible, like in unexpected ways. Uh, absolutely, and and I think uh, one of the only the, the only reason we're, we're so much into bacteria in the in the microbiome, especially in the gut microbiome, is is because the, we have the tools and we're we're a little bit lazy and and kind of searching under the lamp and and going where it's comfortable. Uh, but the more we 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 probe into the virum and the fungum and the parasitome, we find that there are whole kingdoms within our microbiome which are understudied and underappreciated, uh, but nonetheless, I think that they have potential huge impacts on how the human body behaves in health and on the risk of developing disease and even on other kingdoms within the microbiome. So, so these huge amount of, of, of exciting research to, to be conducted uh, in decoding these, these uh, roles of these other kingdoms. And, um, you know, the, the, the future will tell us. Well, it's, it's very, very exciting. Um, and I kind of just want to follow up. I, I do want to ask you about some of the, the top lifestyle modifications. Um, and I know that we've been talking a lot about personalized nutrition, so it's challenging to answer that question. But um, before we get there, just out of my own interest, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about the compounds that are generated in the gut, um, per perhaps from, you know, many of the bacteria in the gut and how these compounds can have beneficial effects on, on human, human health and also can have detrimental effects on human health. And there's one compound that uh, I've, I've, been following for a while and I continue to follow. And um, it's a compound that is associated with atherosclerosis and heart disease. It's TMAO. And it's produced from precursors like L-carnitine um, or even choline, um, which are found in red meat and eggs, uh, re respectively. Um, but you'll, you'll find a lot of conflicting evidence looking at, for example, the observational data, epidemiological studies, where you see people you know, people that eat red meat and or, you know, eggs, if they are healthy and they don't have metabolic disease, they don't have type 2 diabetes or dyslipidemia, they don't have unhealthy lifestyle factors. So for example, they, they're active, they don't smoke, they don't excessively drink, they're, you know, not overweight, that they, they actually don't have a higher cardiovascular disease risk or mortality or all-cause mortality as people that are not consuming those types of foods that are high in uh, L-carnitine or choline. But you'll see if people have unhealthy lifestyle factors, they do have an elevated risk. And so there's, again, a lot of, you'll see a lot of conflicting evidence and it's, you're trying to figure out, well, what's, the, what do I eat? What do I eat? What do I not eat? Um, what role does the microbiome play in the production of the TMAO, which is um, yeah. thought to be associated it, with heart disease? Yeah. It's a great it's a great question based on, on a great set of stories by by, by Stan Hazen's group, um, uh, which I think uh, contributed a, a very important concept to our understanding of how the microbiome cooperates with the human body in generating generating together compounds which may impact human health. So in this particular case, uh, we're talking about um, a connection between dietary compounds such as choline and carnitine, which are digested by the microbes into 
to a compound called TMA, which then influxes into the host and is further converted by the host, by the liver of the host into TMAO. And this TMAO swims into um, uh, the circulation where in some instances it could impact macrophages that form plaques that uh, are responsible for atherosclerosis and it's potentially devastating health effects, heart disease, brain disease, kidney disease, and, and, and more. Um, um, so from a fundamental microbiome perspective, this is a fine example of a cooperation that exists between dietary uh, um, cues that are perceived by the microbes and then further uh, modulation by the host that leads to a health outcome. Now, you're absolutely right that if you look at a health perspective, and now I'm speaking as a physician, you know, you, you cannot explain atherosclerosis by just one factor. You cannot say that, you know, uh, a one type of microbial reaction or one type of, one type of food or, or even one genetic risk factor in a human individual would explain the entire spectrum of this huge and highly variable disease. But by definition, these common multifactorial diseases are influenced by a combinatorial collection of risk factors. And I think what this fascinating uh, study has provided was a proof of concept on how mechanistically one could explain the, the influences of particular types of diet and the microbes on the, the risk of, of, a particular, of developing a particular disease in some individuals with other risk factors that contribute to this disease. So, so I would never expect that every individual that would be exposed to the same levels of carnitine or would feature the same bugs that convert uh, uh, um, choline into TMA uh, uh, would develop heart disease. Uh, it's a combination by many different uh, risk factors. Coincidentally, we've recently published another uh, um, study uh, focusing on a, a peculiar type of obesity that develops after cessation of cigarette smoking. And to make a long story short, we found a similar cooperation between the microbiome and the host in generating compounds that could drive this uh, obesity uh, uh, phenomenon uh, after smoking cessation. So it seems that the concept which we term the holobiont concept in which you can regard a human as a, a combined set of microbes and human cells could contribute to many of the more complex uh, uh, health outcomes uh, that are so concerning to many of us. Well, with that said, um, this has been a really interesting conversation, Iran. Thank you so much. And I just, we've talked a lot about precision medicine, personalized nutrition, and how people respond differently differently to foods. So it's a little hard to, to, to you know, come up with a top lifestyle modifications or, you know, to improve gut health. But, you know, in your opinion, are there some low-hanging fruit we are not there in terms of our precision medicine and personalized nutrition yet. We're beginning to understand a lot more about it thanks to research from your lab and, and others. But are there some some low-hanging fruit, things that like, you know, maybe perhaps consuming foods that have some of these fermentable fibers or prebiotics like you mentioned or fermented foods that also have probiotics and things like that? It's a great question and a question that I'm, I'm being asked very often. Um, I can tell you that, that what we've been uh, discovering in our own studies, um, even you know, without looking into the personalization aspect, um, is that some of the behaviors you know, which your grandmothers would recommend uh, to you are, are also um, beneficial in terms of what they do to the microbiome. So for example, maintaining uh, um, healthy sleep patterns and, and, and avoiding as much as possible uh, erotic sleep-wake behavior has very profound effects on, on, on our measurement of the microbiome and how it impacts um, our regulation of, of weight and, and the glucose uh, or sugar metabolism or, or the avoidance of type 2 diabetes, for example. Um, in terms of, of fibers, you know, in general, I think that the, 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 the data is quite solid in, in promoting fibers as, as, a, as, a, as a good uh, you know, family of foods to consume. However, I must say that we and others are engaged in very exciting studies which suggest that even with fibers, not all fibers are created equal. In other words, you know, even fibers are composed of many different chemical formulations uh, that differ from each other in the way that they are 
consumed by the microbes and impact the human body. Um, so even with fibers and with the generally uh, beneficial effects that have been observed with them, it seems that some fibers are better than others and we're trying to contribute towards new knowledge that would refine these recommendations uh, um, in different uh, individuals and, and with different fibers. Um, you know, smoking seems to be um, a universally bad behavior for many reasons, but when we measure what it does to the microbiome, we, we were intrigued to find that many cigarette related chemicals not only reach the systemic circulation, but they actually penetrate the gut and they impact the microbiome towards a, a disturbed composition and function. And this has its own independent effect on, for example, uh, um, the risk of developing obesity after you start, you, you attempt to, to stop smoking. So, so all of these behaviors, which in many cases we know are probably not good for us, are also not good for us in, in terms of their effects on the microbiome. Beyond this, I think that we need data, we need knowledge, uh, we need to, to increasingly learn to harness diet to the individual in order to really optimize the power of the microbiome in impacting uh, human health. And what about the timing of our food intake? Would you say that's a pretty top? Um... I can tell you that uh, in, in, our in, in, in our personalized nutrition uh, uh, machine learning algorithms, which are used to predict a person's uh, dietary responses in a very accurate manner, the timing of our diet and even the timing of our meal last night are part of the features that are used by this unbiased algorithm in order to form its uh, very accurate predictions. In other words, it seems that the timing of our diet is important for many different aspects coming from many different uh, uh, studies by us and by others. What we do with it, uh, um, in addition to, you know, trying to, to time our diet uh, uh, in a, in a kind of normal and, and routine manner is still uh, uh, under review or, or under research. So this, this um, algor algor algorithm that you were just referring to, um, so this is a, a, a temp company that was, a, was it a started by you or? or yes. So, so basically the personalized nutrition project was an ambitious project, which uh, was uh, headed uh, by me and my, my uh, colleague Aaron Segal, who is a mathematician from uh, the Weizmann Institute of Science. We started with this project uh, back in 2012. And uh, um, this was uh, a study that uh, was first published in 2015 and formed the cornerstone of what we call personalized nutrition today. And in this study, we analyzed uh, the data from a thousand individuals in Israel that uh, kindly gave us a week of their life and we measured uh, and collected an unprecedented amount of microbiome and host-related data, uh, including a smartphone app that was used in this study um, and uh, a continuous glucose measurements that uh, generated very accurate measurements of, of uh, sugar responses to food uh, in, in, in uh, a week of follow-up. And then uh, a very sophisticated machine learning and AI technologies were used to generate predictive algorithms for each individual that are able to accurately predict a person's sugar responses to any given food. And this eureka moment was the basis for personalized nutrition because it allowed us for the first time to formulate diets that are different between individuals, but would uh, hopefully lead to um, um, normalization of blood sugar levels. And this was tested by us in different contexts, including recently in a long-term uh, randomized human trial, uh, uh, which compared this data-driven personalized approach to the gold standard uh, American Diabetes Association recommended diet. And, and we've quite convincingly showed that this personalized science-driven approach was outperforming the current one-size-fits-all diet in a large group of pre-diabetic individuals, which are individuals already predisposed to develop uh, uh, disturbances leading to type 2 diabetes. Um, and this this uh, set of, of discoveries has, has uh, been uh, repeated by other groups across the world um, and is, is gaining track and, 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 and basically tells us that uh, data coming from the host, from the human host, and data coming from the microbiome could be combined using advanced technologies in order to predict and maybe to impact dietary interventions at different uh, clinical contexts. So, so this company, I know it's called Day Two, and mm. um, it, it does does a person have to um, wear a continuous glucose monitor, or like you know, there's a bunch of biomarkers that need to be done to 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 try this out. 
with your yeah, so, uh, that's a great question and 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 just just to make clear to our audience um all all the research that i've stated was academically done um, um in an academic setting without any company involved uh, but following the publication uh, um, the weizmann institute of science have uh, licensed the technology to a spin-off company called day two uh, which further developed it uh, for a massive use uh, in app scaling by, by many more individuals. What the advantage is of day two as a company is that now that they've performed over 100,000 uh, uh, um, tests on, on 100,000 people and more, uh, the, the quality of data that was collected is so great and, and the resolution is so great that no, the, the people that are now engaged no longer need to go through all the procedures that characterize the, the early studies and, and they don't even need to wear a continuous glucose monitor anymore. In other words, uh, a person can now provide a, um, a stool sample um, that can be shipped through the mail plus uh, um, um, some commonly uh, available clinical parameters that they can um, um, provide through the internet, and then um, an accurate prediction of that person's glycemic responses or sugar responses uh, uh, to foods and recommendations that are peculiar and specific for that person could be provided because of the background database that was already created. Um, now, I'm not part of the company. I'm, I'm, I'm the one of the two scientific founders of the company, uh, but the company is now uh, running on its own, uh, uh, mainly in the US um, and is available uh, in the US. Um, and and um, the, the the findings that uh, we discovered have been reproduced uh, by others uh, in other human studies uh, in the UK and in the US. There are um, other commercial entities that are developing the same approaches. Um, I can tell you that uh, in the book we, we published uh, called The Personalized Diet, um, in addition to our story, we also describe a kind of a do-it-yourself a non-commercial way to exploit these discoveries, for example, by buying a, a glucose uh, monitor that, that you know you can purchase in your um, local pharmacy, um, and and by skin pricking yourself and measuring your blood sugar responses after some of the foods that you usually consume at your daily lives, you can now start to tweak your diet and to change ingredients in your, your diet in reducing your sugar responses uh, um, after meals. Um, so you can do it yourself in, in of course, much, much less sophisticated manner, uh, uh, but you can use the same principles that we've discovered in um, changing elements in your diet and making your sugar responses lower uh, um, than before. So it sounds like you're a proponent of, of people wearing a continuous glucose monitor. I've, I've worn one for the past, oh, almost three years. And um, I have learned an immense amount of very interesting information from, from wearing one. Um, probably one of the most surprising ones early on, um, I started wearing it when I was a, a new mother and was the effect of lack of sleep on how the way my body responded to the same foods that I've always eaten in in terms of my postprandial glucose response, and it was completely out of control uh, when I was when my sleep was disrupted. You know, um, there are people that that um, there there are scientists and researchers out there and uh, physicians that do not like the continuous monitor, you know, glucose wearing approach um, because they they claim that it you know, urges people to not eat a healthy fruit or something like that because it may elevate their blood glucose level. What do you think? Well, I, I, uh, I'm not sure I, I, I would like to propose that every person wears a continuous glucose monitor, but I respectfully disagree with those who say that, you know, measuring yourself or, or, or using science and technology uh, in order to improve, uh, um, um, you know, what you do in your daily lives would, 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 uh, you know, be wrong. I, I think that, you know, uh, disregarding uh, all the advances that science is proposing to us um, and, and, and not utilizing these advances in, for our benefit uh, w would probably make us miss a lot of the, of, of the good that science has to offer. Um, so, so by, um, you know, by wearing uh, um, a continuous glucose monitor, uh, you probably experience many surprises uh, um, and, and maybe you know we've we've done thousands of people, and, and I can tell you that 
almost in any person that we've measured, we found counterintuitive surprises. Some people uh, spike their blood sugar to the roof when they eat tomatoes. Now you combine tomatoes with uh, some white bread and, and the response goes down. So, so you know, by, by not doing the experiment or by not measuring themselves, they would uh, devoid themselves from the benefits of knowing what is good and what is less good for themselves. So, so I'm all for measurement. I'm all for knowing and, and for doing this rationally and carefully, but doing it. Uh, I'm in 100% agreement with you. Um, so your so your book is the personalized diet. Um, you co-wrote it with your with your um, collaborator, Dr. Aaron Sengal. Sengal. Your, oh, Seagal. Yes. Okay. And um, day two, which is now licensed by the Weizmann Institute um, for Science, is is the 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 app you were talking about. But again, thank you for talking about the alternative approach with perhaps even people getting a continuous glucose monitor. Um, if people want to follow you, you're on Twitter. Your Twitter, Twitter handle is Elinov underscore lab. So that would be E-L-I-N-A-V underscore lab, L-A-B. And you also have two lab websites. If you if you Google your name, Elon, E-L-A on, yes, Ilana, Ilanov, I-L, sorry, E-L-I-N-A-V. You'll find, you'll find all the, the lab research that you're doing. Phenomenal, I mean, an amazing uh, impact that your research has had on our understanding of the interaction between the microbiome and in our in our gut and human health. And I'm so happy that we were able to connect and have a conversation today. I've been a, a big fan of your your research for for a long time now. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast and and taking time to have this very interesting discussion with me. It's my absolute pleasure um, and, and great talking to you, Rhonda.